appreciate to the uh, generosity and the generous and kind invitation of the organizers. Uh, I have the honor uh, to represent here at this uh, great forum uh, one of the uh, smallest, uh, tiniest uh, European nation that is Estonia. Uh, you probably, most of you probably don't know where Estonia is, uh, then I, I say just uh, that it is very near to Finland, very near to Finland, some 80 kilometers from Finland uh, to, the, to the south. And it is one of the three East Baltic states that were independent between the two world wars. And now, since the decomposition of the Soviet Union, we are again independent. So Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. We are now member states of the European Union, and we are also belong to the Defense Alliance, uh, NATO. So this is the, and the other, Neighbor, the big neighbor is Russia. So this is our situation geopolitically. Now I will speak about uh, can World Dirish revi revitalize your humanities. <clears throat> okay, so. Yes, 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 yes. The main postulate of my discourse is the, is the world humanity's intrinsic challenge of contributing to an axiological turn capable of keeping closely together aesthetics and philosophy, as well as sacrificing authoritarian and uh, profit-targeted monologues of the self to the goal of continuing and expanding spiritually orientated dialogue between a great variety of others, including the world centers and peripheries, cultures of all nationalities and ethnicities, big, minor, and small. World leadership is considered in my conception <clears throat> as a mental spiritual vehicle of great potentiality in orientating humanities uh, towards such a new axiological turn. However, world leadership's uh, concept itself calls for a radical uh, revision and reshaping as the Occidental-centric paradigm looks definitely exhausted, whereas the attempts to replace it by a substantially orientalized paradigm would probably not work either. Instead, I would suppose a more, more balanced uh, and maybe in some respects more realistic approach to Baudirish uh, as an object of teaching, research, and criticism in the first place. According to my own conception, every nation, nationality, and culture is self-conscious community should be as free as possible to define the existing contours of its own World Dirige, World Dirige canon, which naturally may overlap with other canons by other nations and communities to be gradually compl complemented by means of a steady conjoint effort by philosophically minded national and international scholars, writers, and uh, talented translators. <clears throat> and uh, in this process, <clears throat> the radically activated peripheries and borders should have its decisive role. However inadequate the existing canon and whatever the faults and limitations in, in, in the attempt to make it more co complete and acceptable both to centers and peripheries, the permanent imperative for the world humanities community, as far as I can see it, would be to continue to resist comfortable adaptation to fashionable currents and ideologies, which have unjustly diminished the potentiality of world Irish as a substantial part of humanities culture. <clears throat> how many, I ask, how many university departments of institutes bear the name of world Irish? Are there any in the world besides the Gorky Institute of world Irish in Moscow? and the Harvard Institute of World Irish in the US? Maybe there are a few more, but in any case, uh, they seem to be absolutely marginal in comparison, for instance, with general cultural studies, nationally orientated departments and institutes in the home, home countries of which the widespread extension in the case of centric cultures can be found all around the world, including small and smaller countries. There is hardly any institution at which the peripheral part of World Dirish could be dealt with within the general context of World Dirish. <clears throat> the overwhelming cultural commercial ideology thus tends to alienate humanities from World Dirish. Conformism and 
with this uh, tendency largely coincides with self-deconstructionist -de practices in humanity, spiritual, moral orientation. Its direct concomitants are the de-estization and philosophic perceptual de-individualization of, of Voyadirish. What can be done to receive Voyadirish in the periphery and to make periphery more visible in, in Voyadirish? I speak now of our, our Estonian experiment. <coughs> At the start of the 21st century, histories of Lirish might look old-fashioned and exhausted, especially, especially in, in their traditional contours. Yet one has to admit that they still have served as the uh, orientational backbone in Boer Lirish at least until the end of the 20th century. Here let me only mention briefly our effort to compose a a renewed type of Boadirish textbooks. Textbooks. Uh, yes, Boadirish textbooks. Boadirish textbook for high schools and universities. Later, on the same basis, assembling the creative capacity of a dozen Estonian literary scholars in different sections of Boadirish, we started to prepare a substantially broadened historical overview book of Boadirish, both for the use of the general reading public and universities. After long toil, its fruits are now emerging. The structure of that uh, three-volume book uh, could surely be criticized for its heterogeneity, yet it is a consciously constructed lack of homogeneity. The first volume of the bo book, titled The Man Magellan's Winners of Astana Bevani, where Dirish uh, from ancient times till the present day gathers historical overviews of, of at least uh, all uh, major Eastern literary traditions, ancient literatures in near and Middle East, including Arab and Turkish literature, India, China, Japan, Korea. <coughs> These traditions, each of which uh, has its strong idiosyncrasy, have, have been described in the traditional system, nation by nation, language by language. The first volume table of context looks as follows. Now, you can follow more or less, uh, even I don't translate it. First is the Eastern literature, Sita Kirans, then then ancient Near and Middle East and India, you see more or less the chapters there, uh, Iranian Lirish, uh, again all the major phenomena in Iranian Lirish, uh, Arab Lirish, uh, the same, Turkish uh, Lirish uh, from the very beginning and till the, till the modern Lirish, uh, Chinese Lirish, uh, the same phenomena of what uh, we heard here uh, that are all treated in this uh, book uh, by, written by Estonian scholars. Uh, Japanese literature, uh, also a thorough chapter, and then finally Korean literature, thanks to a young Korean man who became doctor of philosophy at our University of Tartu. Well, now the novelty of our new word literature history and its divisions uh, from the tra traditional composition is the deviation from the traditional composition of older world Dirish history it becomes visible above all in volume th two of the uh, overview book uh, and also volume three. Volume two is Western literature from the classical era to romanticism and volume three is Western literature from realism to the present day. In these volumes, the national linguistic principle has been predominantly abandoned. Western European and Europoid literary traditions have been described in a common cultural space, the structural conceptual principle could be called phenomenal generic perceptual. The major literary historic phenomena have been described in their germinal emergence and in the subsequent process of developing the subspecies and modifications. Thus, for example, just Baroque and Neoclassicism, the poetry of the 17th century, Don, Gongora, Quevedo, you see, English Lyrish, uh, Spanish Lyrish, uh, no distinction by, by nations or, or languages. Then 17th century prose Lyrish, uh, Gracian, Banyan, Grimmelshausen, from different uh, cultural spaces, Enlightenment, uh, philosophic and satiric prose, uh, Swift, Montesquieu, Walter Defoe, Rousseau, Herder, and so on. 
and so on. In short, it is an attempt to create a supranational Western comparative literature history, which at the same time means uh, describing in the main lines the existing Western canon of tradition. It goes without saying that if such principles were to become introduced in teaching word literature canon, and this great variety uh, of particular sections at universities all over the world, it could mean a substantial leap from traditionally uh, nationally orientated separatism to a dialogical intercultural treatment of literature, a radical way of overcoming fragmentation in parallel with making students and readers aware of world cu culture in its widest and deepest possible impact, the philosophical, spiritual, mental, sensual, f f psychological, societal, ideological, etc. Besides uh, our three-volume book of Boa Dirish, it us all existing data about, I know, I know, yes, thank you, <coughs> data about translations of Boa Dirish from different languages into Estonian. Does it, uh, its readers, uh, readers can, okay, okay, uh, yes, uh, can follow the historical tr translation story of a nation. And now I come to the final point that is just the other question, uh, uh, how to make small and minority literature visible in, in the world literature canon. Among the newest attempts to favor the reception of Estonian literature in the wider world, uh, world and make it uh, more visible internationally, Estonian writers online dictionary or ever could deserve a special attention. Now I'll try to open it. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay, let me just see. Yes, this is, uh, uh, no, that, that, uh, yeah, yes, it should open now, I hope so, <laughs> yeah, yes, 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 okay, now, now you see, this is uh, our great enterprise, uh, this is Estonian Writers Online Dictionary, a new initiative, I've, I have not heard of, uh, any, of any of such kind of in, in other parts of the world, so it tries to, it tries to just uh, comprise all the existing data, data about uh, Estonian literature, uh, li uh, Estonian writers, uh, uh, but the basis is in, in English, uh, but, the, but the data in all foreign languages as well as in Estonian. And now I only, to finish, I only show what, uh, how this uh, one of the many Estonian writers, uh, we have many writers in Estonia, how, how this uh, founding, the man who founded the Estonian leadership, Friedrich Henschel Kreuzwald, in the middle of the 19th century. Now, okay, just a moment. No, just, 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 just. Kreuzwald, Kreuzwald. <coughs> How many, we have many, many writers in Estonia, you see. Kreuzwald, Kreuzwald, Kreuzwald. Where is Kreuzwald? I'm sorry. Now, here. Here, Friedrich Reinhardt Kreuzwald, you open this, you open this, and now you see uh, his picture, then his, uh, let's say, his portrait as a writer, and a very detailed one in English, uh, and, uh, and then this his major work, the founding work of Estonian literature is an epic, a Kalevi work, The Son of Kalev, written in, uh, published in 1861. Now we see all the data, existing data about these translations, and uh, the full, complete uh, translation exists in in uh, in a s dozen uh, world languages. In English, you you see there are two rivaling uh, rivaling uh, translations. Finnish. Uh, there are also two different translations. French. Uh, this is a new translation by Gallimard uh, of Kalevi Boy, Kreuzfeld Kalevi Boy, German, uh, also several translations in the, in the Hindi language, one translation in Hungarian, several translations Latvian, now a new translation just came out uh, this year, Lithuanian, Romanian, Russian, uh, uh, Swedish, uh, Ukrainian, but no Korean, no Chinese, no, no Japanese until now. There is a lot of work to be done then books, uh, abridged version and excerpts, also a number of languages, Yiddish uh, and so on, excerpts in anthologies and magazines and so on. 
And now, now yes, uh, I, uh, Italians and so on. But uh, I will finish now by just, uh, okay, this is uh, what I enjoy, so. Okay, this final part. <clears throat> It is a huge task and challenge uh, taken up by literary scholars of the University of Tartu. At present, the dictionary is still under construction. Under construction. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> yes, it is under construction. It will take a couple of years more until the task is completed in its basic shape. Evad aims at providing a continuation to paper printed dictionaries of Estonian literature, of which the last one is in Estonian appeared almost 20 years ago. Evad is meant to be polyfunctional as its data should ideally serve both vernacular and international writers, literary scholars, translators, critics, as well as the general public in Estonia and beyond. Literary reception can hardly be imagined as a, an exclusive result of a merit of the work on translators. Deep and more permanent reception is coined as a rule in the collective conjoint effort of translators, critics, literary scholars, and writers themselves. Departing from this conviction and conception, Evert not only gathers the data about translation of Western literary work, but it also assembles all existing as correct and complete as possible information about the basic work of writers in Estonian and its research and criticism not only in English but in all foreign languages. Eva's greatest advantage is, uh, in comparison with paper printed dictionaries is that it can ever and flexibly be expanded, corrected and updated in the future perspective is publishing on paper as well as uh, preparing on its basis an analogous dictionary in Estonian including the data about criticism and research in Estonian, is not at all excluded, but looks perfectly feasible. Thank you. We'd, li We'd like to thank Professor Yuri Pauvit from the University of Tartu for his presentation. Our next presenter will be Professor Wolfgang G. Müller from the University of Jena. His presentation is entitled, What is Human Life Worth? A Dilemma of Who to Save in Philosophy and Literature. Each presenter will have 15 minutes for their presentations. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to, to be here. I'm, I'm, I thank all who are involved in this magnificent event. My subject is the relation between uh, literature and philosophy and I base my argument on a thought experiment attributed to the Greek philosopher Carniades and recorded by Cicero and the church father Lactantius. Two Shipwrecked sailors have to rely on a plank in the sea which can support only one person. Salvation for one of them would only be possible at the cost of the life of the other one. Although um, the, this scenario and its variations, which I will call the dilemma of whom to save or the survival dilemma, seems to be no more than an intellectual game. It has serious juridical and ethical implications. In fact, the thought experiment has a much ri richer ethical potential than its original purely logical or philosophical form may suggest. Instead of two sailors of rough, roughly equal rank, persons of different um, intellectual endowment and social position may be involved. One may be a president or king or persons of different sex or age or health. The two persons concerned may be closely related, for instance, in matrimony, love, kinship or friendship. A variation of 
that this dilemma, dilemma is constituted by a situation um, in which the capacity for salvation in an emergency situation is limited and the choice must be made whom to save among a group of people threatened by death. Part of the saving dilemma may be the feeling of guilt the survivor may have to cope with. Philosophers, especially Leibniz, have focused on some of these problems, but literature in particular is the domain to deal with the ethical problems, what I call the survival dilemma. Before going uh, into my in investigation of the history of the thought experiment in philosoph philosophy and literature, I would like to mention that the problem has numerous real life equivalents. Uh, the most spectacular being the situation of, ah, sorry. The, situa uh, the, uh, uh, the situation on the raft during the shipwreck of the Medusa in 1816, uh, which involved fighting, killing, and canal cannibalism and the wreck of the Titanic in 1912, which as statistics show, the number of the survivors being graded according, according to class. First class more saved, second class less saved, third class uh, 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 least saved. This is of course a scandal. Here the question arises, what is life worth? Which makes the title of Kenneth Feinberg's 2006 book dealing with, with his work as the head of the September 11th Victim Compensation Fund, Fund. A case which looks different, but essentially entailed is the same problem is to be found in the case do of Dr. Anna Poo who was together with her medical colleagues forced to leave a number of life care patients in her hospital in New Orleans, Orleans when it was flooded during the hurricane in 2005. Just as in the Titanic tragedy, people were saved in the order of their status. It is interesting that the love story in the Titanic film ends with an allusion to Carnegie's thought experiment. There is a raft which has room only for one person. The lover sac sacrifices his life for the woman he loves. The number of comparable cases in, is inexhaustible. Think of two children about to get drowned and there's only one person who can rescue them. Or think of the selection of the members of a death squad. Or think of persons asked to, uh, or commanded to risk their lives for their country or for an idea. Now I, let me come to uh, the, uh, to the uh, Carnadia thought experiment. In Cicero's, Cicero's of De Officiis, of Duties, there is the first extant version of the thought experiment, uh, experiment, but Cicero doesn't mention Carneades. At a point in his argument, Cicero asks, supposing a man had to throw a part of his cargo overboard in a storm, should he prefer to sacrifice a high-priced horse or a cheap and worthless slave? In this case, property interest, res familiaris, inclines him one way, human feeling the other. The ethical problem is raised but not, uh, but left undecided. At this point, the criterion of worth, the worth of a man, of what a man is worth is introduced Subsequently, the argument is developed to a kind of ethical aperia. What is to be done if the persons involved are of equal value? The answer is that in such a case, there will be no contest 
uh, contest, but one will take the place of the other as if the points were decided by lot or a game of odds and even. Now, um, let me come to uh, uh, Lactantius, uh, the uh, uh, church father, who um, uh, Christianizes the argument in, questions, in question. Lactantius is the first to mention Carneades in the context of his relations on, just, uh, on justice. He praises him for having denied that there is natural justice. According to Lactantius, Carneades had argued that all animals defended their own interests by the, gui the guidance of nature itself, and therefore that justice, um, uh, if it uh, uh, promotes the advantages of others and ne neglects one's own, is to be called fo foolishness. Now his, um, 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 his um, the, the relevant quotation, it may happen that having suffer, suffered shipwreck, he found some feeble, feeble person clinging to a plank. Will he thrust him from the plank in order to be able to escape? If he shall wish to be just, he will not do it. But he will also be judged foolish, who in sparing the life of, in, uh, sparing the life of another shall lose his own. It can be noticed that the candidate for death in this case is physically disadvantaged, a feeble person, a feeble per person, person on a, on a plank. So from a Christian point of view, it's, uh, it, it is uh, more, it is better to save a feeble person than a, a strong person. So he changes. He changes, semantically changes uh, the argument of Cardianus in, uh, in a Christian di direction. Uh, let me give you, um, uh, uh, or, or I have to, to rush, uh, the f uh, and now let me come to the survival example in philosophy. Uh, Leibniz is the philosopher in the 17th, uh, 18th century, early 18th century, who uh, uh, is most intensively occupied with the dilemma of wh whom to sa save. He goes back to the original version of the thought experiment, but his theocentric position has an affinity with the Lactantius. Actually, I believe that Leibniz ha, ha, had read Lactantius. Supposing the case that hu two humans are threatened to get drowned and the two cannot both be saved but only one, is it then with, within my pure, pure arbitration to so support one and to desert the other one? And does the person who has been forsaken if he is saved by chance, have a cause to charge me uh, in court. Now, what is interesting in this case, that a third person is introduced, a kind of person who decides, uh, who uh, uh, is decide. So the exemplum or the, uh, uh, is opened to, to a juridical dimension. So I'm warned to be, uh, to, to be uh, uh, high. Um, what is interesting, and in, to be rash, uh, what is interesting in Leibniz is that he also introduces the numerical argu argument. In a group of people, only certain people can be, can be saved, which creates a problem. Uh, uh, and let me come on, to g g go on to Kant. Who was most rigor uh, who is most rigorous in this respect? Uh, he says, he 
says in a such, uh, he uh, places the argument in the conflict of usage. He opposes a crystal clear explication of Carnegie's thought experiment, experiment in its original fo uh, form. He says there is no uh, uh, possibility, no right, nobody has the right to, uh, to uh, kill another person in such an emergent uh, uh, situation. Now, let, uh, and in, he says man ha does not have a word, a, a word in a, a utilitarian sense, but man has a dignity. And the constitution of the Federal Republic of Germany begins with a quotation from Kant, the dignity of ma man is untouchable. Now, I see that um, um, uh, there are many examples in literature. For instance, um, Lord Byron, the shipwreck can canto in Don Juan, in which uh, first uh, 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 a dog is killed and eaten, and then a man is killed and eaten, and Don Juan refrains, and that opens a whole uh, um, a field of research and uh, the uh, 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 cannibalism, uh, cannibalism. Then there is the example of um, um, Per Gunt, uh, 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 per, per Gunt, who uh, in the fifth act of this play, which is most in, uh, intensely connected with um, uh, identity pro problems. There is uh, the situation of the cook, who has, who is poor and has a family, and Per Gunt, who has, has, uh, who, who is um, uh, writ, uh, who, who, who wants to just to su survive. So that is an important. Uh, 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 then there is Lord Jim. And uh, Lord Jim, uh, in which a sailor deserts the ship of pil pilgrims. So let me, and um, uh, let me come to my final uh, part, the conclusion. In the course of our of discussion, we could notice that philosophy and literature have different approaches to the problem, a uh, problem in questions, and more broadly speaking, off different kinds of cognition. In philosophy, cognition is the result of reasoning, that is to say of uh, argument and deduction, while in literary works, cognition is the result of representation in terms of human action. To put, it, uh, to put something before the eye, ante oculus honore. Our investigation has made it necessary to expand the meaning of the term cognition cognition or insight, German erkenntnis, to include literature as a provider of insight and cognition. A more elaborate definition would determine cognition in philosophy as intellectual cognition, which subjects the world and its issues to intellectual and argumentative scrutiny in order to find out fundamental ideas and judgments and cognition cognition in literature as the result of representation emerging in literary fictional renditions of life and experience, which include uh, emotional states and processes of exist existential situations of life, uh, life. While a philosopher may try to define on the level, level abstraction of abstraction qualities such as fear or guilt or love or abstract constant concepts like justice, the literary artist represents such feelings of notions on the level of concretization as they affect the inventive character when carefully constructed with well, pl uh, plots. Now, since I'm selfless, I spare you the best part of my paper, uh, which uh, deals with ethics in philosophy and, uh, li uh, and literature literature and thank you for your patience.
Our next professor is Professor Kim Jong Myung from the Academy of Korean Studies. His presentation is entitled A Human Image of Modern Society and Life of Coexistence. The purpose of my uh, presentation is to find a desirable human image in a rapidly changing global community, especially focusing on the Republic of Korea. In this presentation, based on related scholarly achievements, uh, my previous research and experience and the recent media reports, I will examine the issues of modern Korean society. From the epistemological perspective of early Buddhism as a life education system, to this end, the following will be examined. Current global issues, an analysis of their causes, the importance of changing consciousness and presenting a desirable human image. In my conclusion, I will argue that a desirable human in modern society is a person who can live a life of coexistence based on a clear recognition of the nature of existence. In addition, beyond the practicality, liberal education to produce such human beings is required. In this context, this pre presentation targets Korea, but its uh, results may be applicable to other parts of the world. People enjoy a more convenient life in a modern society than in the past. However, environmental issues, nuclear issues, refugee problems, social inequalities, and the conflicts among nations remain serious global issues. The merits and demerits coexist in Korean society as well. Korea has attracted a great deal of attention from the world due to its democratization, industrialization, and Korean way. However, various indexes related to Korea, including Korea's well-being index and the social integration index, indicate that modern Korea is far from promoting a happy life and polarization and corruption are behind it. In particular, pollution, inequality, and corruption appear to be major impending issues in modern Korean society. Since the Rio Declaration of Environment and Development of 1992, the issue of pollution has become a critical issue of the world, and Korea is no exception to this. In Korea, the typical problem can be seen in the form of fine dust and green algae related problems. Fine dust is also known as aerosol or particular metal and refers to airborne pollutants such as sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxide. The fine dust issue is also a cross-national issue between Korea and China. The problem of green algae at the national level is considered to be the product of a major river improvement project prompted by the Korean government in recent years. As the French economist Thomas Piketty pointed out, inequality refers to economic, intellectual, and cultural discrimination within human society that emerged with the development of capitalism. Like in other global communities, there are various examples of inequality in contemporary Korea. Among them, the issue of economic inequality appears to be the most serious issue of contemporary Korea. In particular, the housing problem is typical of that. The housing problem is causing one of the biggest social problems in Korea, such as marriage and childbirth avoidance and the resulting population cliff phenomena. Of Korea's total households, about 42% are homeless, and the greatest number of houses owned by an individual was more than 2,000 high-ranking government officials, heads of local government, and even minors are also among the multi-home owners. In this situation, the life goals of many young Korean, Koreans remain at the stage of the desire for survival, the lowest level of Abraham Harold Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Along with the industrialization in Korea, 
the corruption problem has become an important national issue. In 2016, the so-called Kim Young Nan's Act was enacted. Nevertheless, as of 2018, Korea's corruption index is ranked 51st in the world and 29th in the OECD, overshadowing the nation's 10th largest economy. The former two presidents in Korea, Park Geun-hye and Lee Myung-bak, are also in custody for alleged corruption. What causes these issues? The causes of pollution, inequality, and corruption will be complex. However, I seek to find the causes of these problems from the lack of awareness of the nature of existence and the limitations of liberal education in modern Korea. The pollution problem is the result of emphasizing the life of anthropocentrism while neglecting coexistence with nature. Inequality is a product of our mistaken view of life. Corruption is also a product of the same vein. Local liberal education in Korea is pursuing practicality. We generally insist on me and mine and are living in a field of survival of the fittest. In modern Korea, the standard of evaluation for an individual seems to be based on his or her position, power, or wealth rather than on personality. This is my understanding. However, our general idea of me and mine appears to be wrong. Usually, I am living a life obsessed with myself, mistaking myself as an unchanging and eternal entity, a product of ignorance about the essence of me. In such an illusion, we live a hundred years of life at the longest, full of greed and selfishness, and unaware of the variability and finitude of our physical and mental components or neglecting such perceptions. The world is none other than the outer objects that I can be aware of with our five sense organs. If I am not eternal, so will be the world I perceive. Attachment to mine is a product of ignorance of the essence of the world that I recognize. In this way, we are living a life tainted by selfishness and greed, mistakenly thinking that I and mine will be eternal. The issues of a modern society are also the result of this erroneous thinking. In particular, Korea's largest asset is said to be a well-educated personal capital. However, the reality of a liberal education in modern Korea is different from such a claim. After liberation in 1945, Korea introduced American education system. Modern humanities were not practical studies. Liberal education in the West had a significant meaning as a process of developing the basic abilities and personalities that must be attained as leaders who lead society. The goal of liberal education in Korea has changed from educating liberal arts to cultivating practical talents that can be used immediately by companies after graduation. This tendency has been further emphasized since some of the private universities became the property of conglomerates. Therefore, the major issues of modern Korean society, pollution, inequality, and corruption can be seen as a product of ignorance about the nature of existence and the limitations of liberal education. Is there an alternative? The change of our consciousness seems to be an answer. My life works when I perceive the world, and the world is the product of my mind or consciousness. However, misperceptions lead to wrong behavior, such as pollution, inequality, and corruption. Uh, the singer Nahuna uh, is called the emperor of Korean popular song. It is true that our physical and mental factors are impermanent. If none of these factors that comprise me are permanent, then what will be called I? What are the attributes of the world that I am aware of? 
the nature of my abstract pursuit, power, wealth, honor, etc., is not permanent, but has a changing nature. If I do not have a mind, why do I need to live a life obsessed with it to the detriment of others? In particular, since housing is one of the three conditions of human life, along with food and clothing, it cannot be and must not be the object of speculation. In short, having the idea that I and mine are not eternal and practicing it in real life will be an alternative to solving the problems of a modern Korea and the global village. The desirable human image has changed across time and space. The pre-modern era of the East and the West was the era of a physical force and the preferred human image was kings wielding absolute power and politicians and generals with mighty puissance. The image of the great man of modern Korea was not different. In contrast, the life of millennium says that great people in human history refers to those who overcome hardships, led the spirit of the times, and greatly influenced the human life. Thomas Edison was a classic example who gave humans the power to create light without fire. Segi Hiroshi cites the three types of human beings. Niccolo Machiavelli classified in his Il Principe, the prince, saying, the first type refers to people who can think for themselves, second to those who understand what others say, and third to those who cannot do either. A lot of people in traditional Japan belong to the second type, and it was a great characteristic and strength of Japan. However, after the collapse of the bubble economy, its strength seems to be disappearing. In this regard, Kim Taekyung argued, in order to survive in a changing era, one must have sufficient capacity to enter the second type in every field and become the first type at least in a certain field. According to a UCLA research team, the condition of longevity of supercentenarians, those over 110 years old, was to eat less and exercise moderately, suggesting that living in wealth is not a major condition of longevity. Socrates, the first philosopher of mankind, changed the fundamental basis of values by arguing that what is most important for human happiness is not money or power or honor, but the state of his soul. Healthy relationships are also stressed as a condition of happiness. Robert Weldinger, a Harvard psychiatrist, and his members are conduct has conducted research on happiness. This study is the longest running study of 75 years in history as a single project. The research team's conclusion is that the condition of happiness is not wealth, nobility, or honor, but a healthy relationship with family, friends, and communities. According to these arguments, a person who maintains a healthy relationship with a healthy state of mind would be a desirable human being. The Future of Education and Skills, Education 2030 by OECD emphasizes common prosperity, sustainability, and well-being to develop as a whole person. In Korea's 2015 revised curriculum, four objectives were set as educational goals, understanding a desirable human image in terms of personality, being independent, being creative, being cultivated, and living together. It is difficult to see that the reality of a liberal education in modern Korea is faithful to these educational goals. I think that in modern Korea, the most important of these educational goals is a living together. The outcome of individual behavior defines the mode of behavior of the society. Therefore, proper recognition of the nature of existence will be an essential precondition for building a good society. Why is it that Nathaniel Hodon's The Gray Stone Face, about which I learned in my youth in the 1960s, reminds me in a world full of materialism 
and Phariseism? There, the great man was not the rich, the general, or the poet who made a secular success, but the one who lived a faithful life of sober wisdom, natural emotion, and a simple heart. Furthermore, isn't it said that man's worth is determined when his coffin cap has been closed after his death? In conclusion, a, desir a desirable human figure in a rapidly changing world appears to be an owner and practitioner of the right perception of myself and the world or mine. He will be the owner of a healthy mental state and the relationship who can think for himself and pursues and practices the coexistence of natural and human societies. In addition, beyond the practicality, liberal education to produce such human beings is required. Thank you for attention. We thank Professor Kim for his presentation. Our fourth presenter will be Professor Tunda Adelika from Iowa State University. And the title of his presentation is Black Men in the American Imaginary from Slavery to Black Lives Matter. Anyone who has been following developments in the United States in the last decade could not have missed the upsurge in the killings of unarmed black men by the police or self-appointed vigilantes. Many are perplexed by this and have wondered, you know, why is this happening? How could this happen? And my answer to that, my response to that is, this really shouldn't surprise anyone. This is a logical projection of American history and not any complex history. Simple American History 101. And it is to that history that I turn as I try to construct to show how the black man has been constructed and imagined throughout history to the point where today the life can be taken with such impunity. The killings of unarmed black men by police and self-proclaimed vigilantes have become alarmingly frequent in America, prompting many to conclude that young black men have become an endangered species. While several killings are not headlined and thus concealed from the public, some have provoked public indignation and condemnation. These murders keep happening with frightening frequency. The occurrence of this killing seems to buttress the endangered species viewpoint. The fact that the law enforcement officers and vigilantes involved were either not charged at all, or in some cases, tried and found not guilty and acquitted had galvanized public outrage that birthed the Black Lives Matter movement. Why is there no collective national outrage against the murders of unarmed black men? Why have these killings become routinized and normative? This paper attempts to answer these questions by tracing the historical dynamics undergarding the contemporary disregard for the sanctity of the lives of black men. One has to start with examining the stereotypes embedded in the institution of slavery. Winthrop Jordan suggested that many of the behavioral patterns and beliefs responsible for the dehumanization of blacks in the 20th century existed more than 200 years ago. Europeans who colonized the New World regarded blacks as, quote, corporal creatures and fundamentally different. This was also the viewpoint of the founding fathers of the American Republic. The only reality and future they envisioned for blacks was being slaves. Though the Constitution adopted in September 1787 did not mention the word slavery, but instead used phrases such as such person and other persons. There were almost 500,000 such persons when the Republic was born. The 1857 United States Supreme Court decision in Dred Scott versus Sanford affirmed the primacy of slave identity. The court decided that blacks were, quote, unfit to associate with whites, and the Negro might justly and lawfully be reduced to slavery for his benefit, unquote. Thus, blacks were objects and denied human attribute. 
Carl Degler argued that from the very beginning, blacks were treated as chattel, and the distinguishing attribute of chattel was being non-human. As chattel, slaves could not envision family relationship. This also abrogated the male slave's ability to function as head of his family. Male slaves watched helplessly as whites raped and abused female slaves. The, no the dominant imaginary portrayed blacks as objects in need of the constant supervision and guidance of whites. Such condition, many believe, will, refrain, will restrain the potent but dormant animalistic attributes of black men. Slavery required the imposition of subhuman status and thus denial of the slave's humanity. This obtained from 1619 to the ratification of the 13th Amendment ending slavery in 1865. The attainment of freedom did not obliterate the stigma of slavery. Free blacks were discriminated against and restricted to demeaning occupations. Blacks generally were associated with values that fed the American imagination with negative images of peoples of African descent as deserving of far less. Pseudo-intellectuals and pro-slavery ideologues and writers portrayed blacks as animals closely related to apes and monkeys. With ratification of the 13th Amendment and ensuing radical reconstruction reforms came attempts to restore the humanity of blacks. Blacks gained citizenship, the right to vote, and promise of equal protection of the law. Yet, they were not fully integrated. The end of slavery did not usher in a nation that accepted or gave blacks full equality and dignity. Instead, black transited from chattel to Jim Crow, which further subverted their humanity. The association of blacks with animals became even more pronounced after the demise of slavery. Writings of leading American intellectuals, as well as magazines, newspapers, and journals depicted blacks as, quote, half child, half animals, mentally impaired, dangerous, and a threat to society, especially white women. Some of the publications represented blacks as neurologically challenged and prone to violence. Leading media and academic publications amplified what became known as the black man as beast menace theme. The onslaught on black character mirrored on the currents of anxiety about the social implications of black freedom. There was some ease about the alleged threat of black sexuality. Even as the slave system profited from and thrived on emasculating black masculinity, it did acknowledge paradoxically and nurture that humanity. With foreign importation of slaves at law in 1808, Southern planters confronted a dilemma. Where to acquire slaves for their plantations? Many began to improvise by producing slaves domestically. They coupled male and female slaves for breeding. This domestic slave manufacturing increased the property and enhanced the wealth of many planters, such as John Smith's master, who, according to Smith, quote, started with two women and ended and raised 300 slaves, unquote. Nothing more exemplified the dehumanizing nature of chattel slavery than slave breeding. Black men became sexual objects, tools, at the convenience and disposal of the masters. Slave breeding ultimately infused in planters a gnawing and threatening image of the black man. By using black men as breeders, white planters had birthed a boogie that would haunt America for decades, the mythical black rapist. The exploitation of black sexuality reinforced pre-existing but subdued notions of black hypersexuality. It has been suggested that whites had harbored the image of the black man as hypersexual and imbued with insatiable sexual desires since their first encounters. According to Winthrop Jordan, long before their formal contact, Europeans perceived Africans as, quote, lustful and venomous, people endowed with insatiable sexual drives. One early explorer referred to the Mandingo penises as, quote, burdensome, another marveled at their, quote, large propagators. The chain of slavery and demand for plantation labor had kept the black man's sexual propensity and the fear it embodied in white in check. After the end of slavery, this would become both emotionally and psychologically unsettling to whites, who were now tormented by the thought that, quote, left alone, black sexual animals and predators who unleash their hypersexuality on white women. There was thus a pervasive atmosphere of black scare across the nation, a scare 
that free black men were not only seeking economic and political rights, but also white women. Blacks were widely perceived as driven by desire for sexual equality and an innate fondness for white women. Some blame the Civil War and Reconstruction reform for infusing in blacks the belief that they could and should, in fact, strive for social equality and intermarriage. No Southern group was more threatened by blacks' desire and their, than the virtuous and defenseless white woman. There was supposedly something alluring and seductive to the Negro in the appearance of white women. To counteract this threat to the South, priceless jewel of splendor and faultless womanhood, extreme measures were introduced, including violence and lynching. If a white woman accused a black man of rape or attempted rape, quote, we see to it that the Negro is executed, quote, declared Arkansas poet John Gould Fletcher. Every able-bodied white man assumed the existential duty of protecting vulnerable white women with a crusading zealotry reflected in the intensity and barbarism of lynching orgies that engulfed the country from the late 1880s to the 1950s. The castration, castration was a signal ritual of the lynch mob. Some states even passed laws prescribing frustration for black men who attempted to rape white women. This symbolized extinguishing the sexual causative object of white anxiety. It was also a subliminal message to all black men about the consequences of not respecting the sexual boundary. Thousands of black men were lynched for alleged rape or attempted rape of white women. And most of the accusations were later proven to be false. Lynching exemplified public and national devaluation and delegitimation of black lives. Newspapers publicized and hyped the alleged hypersexuality of black men. It was also a popular research in the humanities, sciences, and social sciences. Several scholars theorized about black sexuality and the threat to white women. This gave lynching culture a national audience and acceptance. When lynching, when lynching declined and the lynch mob receded, the state agencies and apparatus took over. Between 1930 and 1981, 4,500 men were executed, not lynched, executed for rape. Of that number, 405 were black men. They were put to death on the flimsiest, flimsiest evidence, mostly the words of white women. The lynchings and accompanying macabre orgies reflected the depth of America's obsession with the threat of black sexuality. The black man had become America's sexual boogie, ever-present threat to white women. To be a black man in America, therefore, is to, to be saddled with the extra burden of assumed criminality. Black and crime became synonymous in the American imaginary, to the point where many readily invoke that linkage even when a white person had committed the crime. The cases of Chuck and Carol Stewart in Boston in 1989 and Susan Smith in Union, South Carolina in 1995 come to mind. There was also the case of black men lynched for allegedly murdering white women or kids only for their innocence to be proven after their death. A good example was the case of the 14-year-old Justini in Alcolo, Clarendon County, South Carolina, who was wrongfully executed in 1944. In 2014, South Carolina publicly acknowledged that, in fact, it had executed the wrong person. By the 1960 civil rights movement, the image of the black man as a rapist had become coupled with his image as social and economic parasite, perennially unemployed, unemployable, uneducated, uneducable, with a pathological disdain for moral, unambitious, and thus, and thus a parasite. This became justification for maintaining white supremacy. With young black men unable to acquire quality education, they are less likely to secure decent jobs, and without which they are forced into underground economies. The negative image of black men births a counterculture of vigilantism reflected in the epidemic shootings of unarmed black men, mass incarceration, and the expansion of the prison industrial complex. What the history shows is that after slavery, black men transited into a world of other forms of unfreedom and the nullification of their humanity. They will remain the other, less deserving, subhumans, whose lives we are not worthy of the protection of and validation by the state. The fact that freedom did not completely restore and affirm the inviolability of black humanity birthed and sustained the civil rights movement. The numerous unsolved and solved but unprosecuted cases of black lynchings and assassination during the 1950s and 60s underscores how devalued black lives have become. There is still demonstrably flagrant disregard for the sanctity of black lives. 
death fight for civil rights, for civil war and reconstruction reform, and subsequent civil rights era reforms, there lingers in the imagination of a significant section of the American population, particularly law enforcement officials, those negative and nullifying images and portraits of black, especially young black men. They are seen as brutish, disorderly, and a menace. Efforts to stifle civil rights and prevent implementation of welfare and social reforms are premised on age-old demonization of blacks, portrayed as lazy, brutes who seem uncomfortable with violent, get-rich-quick schemes. Blacks and the poor in general are dismissed as undeserving of any, get, of any government assistance. In anti-civil rights and anti-social welfare reform initiatives drove public discourses and policies. This became more pronounced under the presidencies of Ronald Reagan and the Bush. Ronald Reagan in particular was noted for invoking ethos of black dehumanization to justify subverting civil rights and social welfare, social reforms. Unemployed, uneducated, unemployable, and unemployable blacks who in desperation sought other means of bettering themselves were characterized as a pest and a menace. The prison industrial complex expanded. Americans who considered black second-class citizens not deserving of same rights were only temporarily subdued, not completely defeated by the reform initiatives from reconstruction to the civil rights movement. Jim Crow and the lynchings it unleashed, as well as the modern civil rights, the modern anti-civil rights and anti-social reform re initiative, the resurgence of nativism all attest to the determination of that segment of America that perceived blacks as less deserving. The depiction of blacks as animals remain an enduring trait of American society. Blacks who seem to challenge established stereotypes readily earn these attributes regardless of education and status. Being elected to the highest office in the country did not immune Barack Obama, who was repeatedly caricatured as a monkey. The association of blacks with animalistic attributes have become widespread since the election of Donald Trump. Trump frequently demeans his black critics by depicting them as animals and questioning their intelligence. After securing the Republican nomination as governor of, uh, for governor candidate of Florida, Trump backed Ron DeSantis, warned Floridians, quote, not to monkey up this election by voting for a Democratic candidate who is black. The animalistic attributes ascribed to black Americans and in the American imaginary sustain and nurtures the blatant disregard for the sanctity of black lives. A significant segment of American population has yet to jettison the historic and racist images and perceptions of blacks and the limitations they signify. Blacks who challenge this worldview by their demonstration of intelligence and accomplishment are bitterly resented. Black men have transited from the late 19th and early 20th century image of sexually depraved beasts with insatiable desire for and, a, and thus a menace to white women to the late 20th and early 20th century, 21st century image of an ever-present threat and danger to the comfort of white America. They are presumed guilty until proven innocent. Like in a relay race, Olympic, the baton of targeting young black men in society has passed from the lynch mob to the state. Now high tech, the lynching of black males occurs within the purview of government and law enforcement agencies. As several scholars have argued, the blatant and racist rationale for lynching have been replaced by coded phrases fundamentally of the same meaning and intent disguised as, racial, as race neutral. Yet, disproportionately, these policies target young black men. State intervention of this nature have been traced from Richard Nixon's war on crimes against criminals the she who supposedly threatened urban America down to Ronald Reagan's war on drugs. They shared a relentless opposition to social welfare reform. Urban America, where blacks are concentrated, have been designed as war zone, crime prone, gang infested, and subjected to draconian governmental and law enforcement policies. The fact that Americans see predominantly young black men arrested and paraded on television and in pages of newspapers and magazines as pathological and incorrigible criminals only reinforce those historic racist attitudes and stereotypes. Black men have been targeted and maligned as societal menace and threat since the early 18th century, and the present Black Lives Movement is therefore a logical countervailing development. Thank you. We thank Professor Adelica for his paper. Our final speaker will be Professor Niels Niesen from the University of Amsterdam, and his presentation is entitled Shot on iPhone, Apple's World Picture.
preamble, which actually have the paper. In 2011, In 2011, Apple co-founder Steve Jobs started one of his product presentations by saying that it's in Apple's DNA that technology alone is not enough. That it is technology married with liberal arts, with the humanities, that yields us the results that make our hearts sing. Jobs' words are interesting in three respects. First of all, they testify to a belief, especially prevalent in Silicon Valley, that computer technology facilitates people's creativity and more in general, holds an emancipatory potential. This belief has roots in turn of the 1970s American counterculture. Think here, for example, of Stuart Brand's whole Earth Network, whose mix of ecology and hacking culture uh, was an important inspiration for Jobs. Or of the poem, all watched over by machines of love and grace, which dreams of a cybernetic meadow where mammals and computers live together in mutually programming harmony was a poem that was handed out by its author, Richard Brodekin, in the streets of San Francisco during 1967, Summer of Love. Second, Jobs' words illustrate that large tech companies like Apple, Google, and Airbnb think of themselves as businesses not merely driven by profit, but also by a vision, vision of humanity. Other than Apple's ideal of a technology married with liberal arts, one can think of Airbnb's vision of a world in which people belong anywhere, Google's corporate credo to do no evil, Microsoft's call for a digital Geneva convention, or Facebook's manifesto for a global community. Third and finally, Jobs' ideal of a marriage between technology and the humanities compels one to reflect about the role that the humanities play in the platform society, a society in which for-profit online platforms increasingly mediate and in doing so transform practices, spaces, and social relations until recently deemed public, private, or intimate. As far as this role of the humanities in the platform society is concerned, urgent questions that come to mind are, and questions that follow up on Professor Wang Hui's, uh, Hui's questions. First, what methodological and conceptual frameworks do the humanities offer in response to technological developments that transform all domains of human life, and that perhaps even transform the very understanding of what it means to be human. Second, how do digital and online technologies enter humanities research, not only in the emerging field of the digital humanities, which adopts quantitative methods and its approach to increase of study traditionally associated with the humanities, but also by transforming archives and the ways people write and interact with text, images, and moving images. Third, to what extent is the ongoing integration of traditional humanities disciplines into newly formed interdisciplinary institutional forms a development spurred by digital technology? Not only because these technologies generate new questions that demand new approaches, but also because new technologies facilitate new networks of scholarly exchange. Fourth, how do the humanities engage the development that many people's writing and images nowadays function doubly as marketable data for online platforms? from pictures shared on Facebook and messages sent through Gmail to student papers submitted on Turnitin. And finally, and the question that's most crucial for me, how can, the humanities, how can humanities research contribute to a more critical understanding of the platform society in which online infrastructure developed by major tech companies are integrated into all domains of life? Oh, go back one. In the project I'm working on, called attention, I respond to this last question by analyzing the visions of humanity that tech companies create in the discourses they develop around their platforms. The project premise is that tech company discourses are not mere byproducts of the platform architectures and algorithms themselves, but should be understood as an integrated part of the development of online platforms' new infrastructures that reconfigure people's practices, spaces, and relations. This premise is embedded in a more general understanding of practices and discourses as processes that develop in a continuous dialogue, a premise that's also inspired by Spinoza, for example, I should add. That is to say, practices and discourses do not stand in simple cause and effect relations in which transformations and practices precede certain discourses or vice versa, but practices and discourses stand in a relation of mutual determination. In the case of this project, my project, this means that tech discourses should not be understood as mere branding strategies for previous de previously developed technologies. Instead, 
The vocabularies, images, and modes of understanding that tech companies produce and disseminate as part of their brands are an integrated part of their platforms. Tech companies depend on users that trust their platforms, if only because most platforms are fueled by user-generated data. In an attempt to generate that trust, the major tech companies increasingly present their platforms as neutral spaces for human interaction, addressing people not merely as consumers, but also as a public, as their digital citizens, or as a caring humanity. My project aims to grasp the ideological underpinnings that define the discourses through which tech companies seek to generate their trust. So, what is the vision of human life that informs tech company discourses? For example, and to return to Apple. In 2015, Apple launched its World Gallery campaign, which over a time span of two years features photos from hundreds of iPhone users from around the globe dis displayed on billboard ads in over 70 cities across the globe. The photographs are absolutely stunning, to paraphrase Steve Jobs. From a lonely tree in a desert landscape to a waterfall cascading into a lush valley, from air bubbles trapped in a frozen lake to a sky full of hot air balloons, from strawberries to sunflowers, from a black and white dog caught in light and shade to an equally monochrome play of lines in an underground passageway, from a reflection on a damp sidewalk to the gesture of a child, to paraphrase film philosopher André Bazin. In some cases, these photos appear as giant standalone billboards high up in urban space, like here in New York City or along the highway, like in Los Angeles here, or the photos are part of a series that cover a subway platform, like here in Montreal, or even an entire train station, like here in Berlin, or that keeps a pedestrian company on the sidewalk travels. My question of analysis is very simple. What do these images have in common, other than that they were shot on iPhone 6, without the indefinite article? Browsing through the campaign, a picture forms in the mind's eye of a world that above all is there for a contemplation. A world full of beauty and small things, a reflection, a ladybug, a lone surfer ashore watching a suns sunset, and beauty and sublime vistas, like on this billboard here in Minneapolis taken by a friend. The photo, not the billboard. A world of beautiful people also, because in 2016 the World Gallery had a follow-up of portraits. Portraits of men, women and children simply being human and being in the moment, much like all of the World Gallery's photographers behind their phones who are present with the beauty of the moment when they tap their screens or their volume button which functions doubly as a shutter operator. With the exception of this picture of balancing fishermen in Myanmar, we do not see people at work in the World Gallery or people de depicted in their home situations. There are no pictures of everyday life. Instead, Apple shows us a serene, timeless world captured in high definition. It's a little bit of a cold world view, I should add. A world view that precisely and it's universal right here and right now lacks what Ronald Barthes has called punctum. What strikes us moreover is that we hardly find groups of people in Apple's campaign, unlike, for example, in this Facebook campaign. And in a few photos in Apple's world gallery with more than one person, those persons appear as individuals scattered in the cityscape. The few exceptions are the fishermen we just saw and the spectators at the balloon show. Finally, even though the World Gallery includes a lot of portraits, we do not see selfies. This last fact also struck the two anonymous pranksters behind the also shot on iPhone 6 counter campaign, which for a few days in 2015 in the streets of San Francisco juxtaposed Apple's serenity with a series of weird selfies framed in the World Gallery style. However, the city of San Francisco took down the posters while online Apple killed the also shot an iPhone block with a cease and desist order due to copyright infringement. Clearly, Apple doesn't want people to poke fun at the beauty of its world picture. Finally, what strikes perhaps most in the iPhone 6 campaign and what makes it so, what makes it so blatantly brilliant in its ideology is that Apple does not even make the remotest reference to the digital age. There is hardly any technology in the World Gallery. No phones, no screens, no media, no solar panels, no windmills, like in this contemporary Dutch landscape that I shot myself on my iPhone. No cars also, not even self-driving ones. The only means of transportation we have are the hot air balloons, a bunch of paddle boats, and an Alaskan train. There is no reference, in other words, 
to the platform society, and, and as such, the images contra contrast starkly with the increasingly smart urban centers in which they appear. We only have the lonely, mindful photographer, and in the case of the portraits, the beautiful, mindful subjects, all existing in a timeless right here and right now. And I argue that it's this blissful gaze of a mindful subject that connects Apple's world picture. And I also identify a parallel between, yes, thanks. I identify a parallel between Apple's discourses and recent discourses in Western and specifically American culture around mindfulness meditation. As Jeff Wilson writes in Mindful America, in American mindfulness, the technique of mindfulness meditation is isolated from the larger Eastern cultural religious set of practices and worldview in which it originated. Mindfulness, he writes, is thus transformed so that it delivers cultural benefits desired by Americans. In American culture and Western culture, mindfulness has to become a mindfulness for everyday life rather than as a mindfulness as everyday life. As for example, Shunryo Suzuki defines mindfulness in Zen mind, beginner's mind. He, in that book, Suzuki in that book equates mindfulness, Zazen, or the practice of Zen, and everyday life. They're all synonym, synonymous for him. In American, well, in westernized mindfulness culture, mindfulness becomes instrumentalized for everyday life. So mindfulness in its recent Western and self-declared secular manifestations involves the promise that its practitioner is on the way of becoming a centered subject who is in harmony with the world and themselves. In its, in the, in its instrumental, in, instrumentalized Western sense of the term, mindfulness is an ideology. An ideology 3.0, if one wishes, that exactly like the more old-fashioned ideologies, helps sustain the material relations of production and consumption in which these ideologies are imbricated. Mindfulness is a mindset or survival technique for precarious, atomized existence in late capitalism that lets people believe they have a true connection with the world, even though their job and housing contracts tell a different story. Finally, and as Apple's world picture illustrates, Mindfulness is an exercise in being alone. And even when people come together for mindfulness practice, say in a yoga class, they do so in order to be alone. In this respect, it's no coincidence, I would say, that commercial yoga studios and Apple stores feel so much alike. <laughs> in conclusion, looking at the new American dream as it is produced in Silicon Valley, one sees a subject in control in control of technology and their self-profiles, and in control of their attention, which I understand is the faculty to be present with tasks, things, others, and themselves. This attentive, mindful subject contrasts starkly with accounts of a more scattered and shattered post-human subject, or what Gilles Deleuze has called individual, a subject, if subject is still the right word, who exists almost, almost but not quiet in multiple places at once as the modern binary between public and private life has become blurry, and a subject also believes in an era that market forces infiltrate all domains of life. Last week, when I was in Seoul, I saw a truly excellent um, exhibition on the work of filmmaker Haroon Faraki, an exhibition titled, What Ought to Be Done? It's a very timely question, and I'd like to address this question to the platform society. So what ought to be done in the face of the rising power of tech companies whose resources have started to rival those of entire nation states. So, for example, the, the five largest companies, Alphabet, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, their market value now equals the GDP of Germany. At the same time, these companies are controlled, are operated without any democratic control whatsoever. In answer to this question, what ought to be done? I think, yes, we need, to be, we, we need to approach these companies critically. We need to study their practices critically, and we need to, need to study their discourses critically. But critical study, I would, I would say, alone is not enough. I think it's also important and necessary that people in their everyday lives become much more critical and resist companies that commodify human experience and to explore alternatives, both analog and digital. And I'd like to and on one picture I took in San Francisco of an alternative Apple store. Thank you.
I'd like to thank our five presenters for their very stimulating and concise papers. We've ended on time. Um, please make your way quickly up to the Kisswire Center, out the door and to the left, where the uh, next session of parallel sessions will begin in 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs>